Good morning, uh, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Lorcan Dempsey. I'm Vice President of Research at uh, OCOSI. Uh, very pleased uh, to see you uh, here today in the auditorium and also to welcome uh, those of you who are on uh, WebEx. Uh, this morning, uh, very pleased uh, to introduce uh, Dan Cohen, who will uh, speak to us about uh, the DPLA, the Digital uh, Public Library of uh, America. So, um, I won't say very much uh, by way of introduction so that uh, Dan can get, get into uh, the discussion of uh, DPLA. Um, just a brief, uh, brief note, Dan is a uh, historian uh, with degrees from uh, Harvard, Yale, and uh, Princeton. And I think if you think about some of the uh, intersections that uh, he's been having uh, recently with the uh, library community, um, generally broader uh, scholarly communication um, community, uh, he has um, really had uh, quite a bit of uh, influence. Um, um, he was for 12 years uh, director of the uh, Ray Rosenzweig um, uh, Center for History and New Media at George Mason University, which, uh, where he and others sort of pioneered what we, we sometimes call uh, digital humanities. If you look at that website, you'll see a range of significant initiatives looking at how the practice of scholarship, the practice of uh, managing, curating, sharing uh, information of various sorts is being changed in, in this digital environment. A particular note um, um, is, uh, again, thinking of uh, some of the interests in the, in the room here is the um, uh, production of Zotero, uh, the citation management, research management system, which uh, really uh, uh, very uh, widely used but generated uh, in that center, and also, uh, more recently, uh, uh, Omeka for uh, digital uh, exhibitions for uh, digital um, content uh, management. So uh, Dan um, has a glittering uh, academic uh, career. And recently, um, he decided to open a, a new door um, and become uh, the um, um, executive director of uh, DPLA. Um, so during this talk, he will tell us uh, why he made that move and what the future uh, for uh, DPLA is. So uh, Dan Cohen. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction, Lorcan, um, who has been incredibly kind to me over my career, and uh, it's great to be here at OCLC. I've really um, actually learned a lot from OCLC and the research unit um, here, um, and I'm very interested in collaboration as well. I think one of the things that I'll talk about today is how DPLA is engaging in <coughs> collaboration across the country and indeed across the world. And so. Um, you know, part of my job as executive director is to go around the country and indeed around the world to think about what this partnership should look like. And everyone in this room, and I think a lot of people out there on WebEx, are a key part of that library infrastructure that we're also trying to build. So um, it is wonderful to be here. Um, so today I am going to um, uh, talk about uh, DPLA, obviously. I'm going to start with a kind of overview for those who don't know. Uh, what it is. Maybe I'll take a quick poll right now, um, at least of people in the room. I can't see hands on WebEx, but um, how many people have heard about the DPLA? Okay, good. How many people have visited our website? Okay. How many people load our homepage every day at breakfast? Okay. <laughs> um, you should start doing that um, because we've got new stuff every day. Um, great. Okay, so there is some familiarity. I will quickly go through a, a general overview, at least for folks who might not know parts of what we're doing. And then I think since this is a very knowledgeable crowd, I will get a little bit behind the scenes as the title of the talk entails. We're going to go a little bit inside of what we're doing uh, on the technical side um, with our metadata and talk a little bit more deeply on that. So we'll, we'll have a nerdier portion in the second half of the talk. Um, but I am very happy to, again, to be here and to give this overview. Um, you know, I, you know, Lorcan was, uh, in his prompt was saying I was going to tell you about why, why I left a cushy academic job. Um, and I, I just think, you know, DPLA is just tremendously exciting. The idea of bringing together the riches of America's libraries, archives, museums, cultural heritage sites, all this incredible content. Actually, if you think about it, and I'm glad Lorcan brought up Zotero, um, which is a software product that we produced at the Center for History and New Media. 
A lot of the point behind that, the impetus behind that, I mean, software created by historians, that's very odd to begin with, but a lot of that was because um, we had all these hidden collections, um, historical collections and other kinds of collections that we thought a piece of software could help to surface, to share with other scholars, um, other researchers around the globe. And so a lot of that same impetus behind Zotero and what we were trying to do there um, really has carried on with me into DPLA. Um, I just think it's a tremendous and will, will inevitably be a multi-year or multi-decade effort to think about how we can make these tremendous collections that are out there across the nation more available, widely available to everyone. Um, and so it's a really exciting project. We are only <coughs> some months in. Um, we'll come up on our one-year launch uh, in a month, a little over a month. So um, a lot of what I'll talk about is just where we are in this very early stage. And I think you'll see the project change and evolve and grow in the coming years. But it's great to be here in the early stage and to let you know what we're doing right now. But again, in the second part, I'll talk about where we're going. OK, so let me provide a bit of an overview here. I like to talk about, uh, it's always good to have a mnemonic device, um, our three Ps, the sort of if you need to tell someone what the DPLA is about, uh, I always focus on these three things, that we're a portal, a platform, and we're an advocate for the public option. That is, we do have a website, dp.la. Again, you should load that repeatedly to give us good web stats for the day. Um, we are a platform, um, much like OCLC is. Right? We run a technical infrastructure that others can use, reuse, extend, and I want to talk a lot about that again later on. And also, I view myself and our organization as being part of a, a, of a cadre of like-minded institutions that are trying to advocate for a strong public option for reading and research in the 21st century. Um, I think this is part of what we're doing that may be a little bit more hidden versus the technical or website presence, but I do want to emphasize that we are in the business, and I have been in the business personally, of advocating for open access for over a decade. And um, it's another reason why I took this job is that I feel we can be a good strong force for this, considering where things could go. I mean, we, you know, as a historian, one of the things you learn is that it's not always clear the direction that things will go. And in, in hindsight, it all seems so obvious, but actually when you're in the moment, there are lots of forks in the road. And I think we are at one where we have new devices like iPads and Kindles that lock down content in, in ways that are troublesome to me. Um, we have libraries that are really struggling with things like procurement of eBooks. Um, also very troubling to me. And it's not entirely clear to me that we can maintain a kind of democratization of access to knowledge. And I think particularly in the United States, we've always had this ethic, at least since the Carnegie Libraries, for over a century, that we do provide maximal open access to materials. That's part of our world here in the United States. And I, I, without being rah-rah USA, I think it's also a global um, uh, ethic now as well. Um, and so we do want to advocate for that kind of openness and the struggle that's involved. I'll actually, I'm going from here down to DC. There's a big meeting early next week at the US Copyright Office and the Library of Congress about the future of mass digitization and orphan works. Uh, that is books that are in this gray area where we're not quite sure about their copyright. And I'll be one of the people who are advocating again for maximal openness there. So I just want to point that out. I won't dwell on it too much today, but I think it is an important part of what DPLA is doing. Okay, so um, just a quick scan across the, uh, the website here. Um, uh, again, uh, I like to think we've got a nice, easy layout. Um, we have a responsibly designed website that works on all devices. Um, you can see it's chopped up into certain areas, and, and one of the things I do want to emphasize is that I like to think we provide a lightweight layer over collections that allows different ways in. Um, different modes of discovery. People work in different ways. It's something I've certainly discovered as a teacher that students work in very different ways, um, find things to research and, and to look at in different ways. And indeed, we do have a kind of Google-like search box, which probably half of our traffic goes through there on the left side. But we also have um, curated portions that I'll show in a second, um, and other things like maps and timelines. Um, so let me look at that right now. I think one of the neatest things that we're doing is thinking about geocoding and geolocation. And I'll get into the data portion of this later on. Uh, but we do provide a way to just scan the entire collection, 
um, on a map-based interface. I'm focusing here in the United States, but actually, of course, America's collections include collections from around the world. So you can actually zoom out and go to other places. Um, but uh, here, focusing on the United States, what we do is we have these bubbles, and you can zoom in. By the way, today I'm going to focus on Columbus, so I've got some material here from right around here. Um, so as we zoom in, as you can see to Columbus, um, these bubbles uh, split up, and you can go in and find um, exactly what you're looking for. When you click on one of these bubbles, it will show you that we have 73 items from downtown Columbus, Ohio, and you can scroll through them and find the materials that way. Um, again, very different than your 10 text links of Google or most um, library systems, which give a very similar kind of interface, a very textual interface. This is a way to browse the entire collection geographically. We also have a timeline, super fun on an iPad. You can flip your finger back and forth, go through time, you feel like a time lord. Um, <laughs> you can click on any of those bars and it will show you um, exactly what we have from that specific year. If you have a keyword already set um, in your search, it will just show you materials. Um, as in this case, we have 233 items from 1950. Um, very easy to find. So again, we are trying to provide a kind of quickest way from point A to point B for someone who's browsing, researching, to find their materials without going through a very textually heavy interface, although there are um, interfaces that look like that as well. Um, we're also trying to innovate in terms of presentation of certain kinds of item types. Uh, over the summer, last summer, we imported over a million books from Hathi Trust, and we thought we needed a very distinct interface for the browsing of books. Um, one of the things that we talk a lot about, and I recently wrote a piece on the DPLA blog about this, is we're really interested in serendipity in research. It's something that's, I think, poorly understood, um, and uh, how people bump into items that might be of interest to them that might not necessarily be a part of very targeted research. Um, if you look at stats, for instance, there's not a lot of people who do very sophisticated Boolean searches. Again, we are among a very knowledgeable audience here. There's probably lots of people using all those ands and ors and you know, various signs and things like that. But actually, 99% of the public do not do anything like that. And um, I think there's much to be said about an interface that does have a little bit of skeuomorphism or representation of the physical space where you do bump into things um, like on a bookshelf. Um, I had, as I wrote in this piece on our, on our blog, I actually had a mentor who literally had a book fall on him um, when reaching for another book on a very high shelf. And he ended up like basing his entire career of research on this book that fell on him because it happened to be next to, next to the book he really wanted. Um, so, um, and we could sit here and unpack that for a half hour of exactly what went on there. Actually, I think librarians were really involved in that, right? Because there was some cataloging decisions there. Um, but uh, um, also physics was involved. Um, but here's something where I think DPLA will continue to try to interface on the front end. Um, again, as a kind of layer on top of America's collections where we can provide new ways in. We do have exhibits, um, and um, these are really terrific, I think, ways to look at kind of curated collections of a couple of dozen items, um, again, brought together from uh, hundreds, I'll get to the numbers in just a second, of collections across the United States. Um, we have them on various uh, moments in American history. Um, we, in fact, just launched yesterday, or two days ago, two really great exhibits from, um, that were put together by uh, library and information science students. One on the gold rush, which is fantastic. Some of these uh, 19th century photographs are really amazing. And another one on the history of theater in the Great Depression, also very, very interesting. Um, so I encourage you to look at those. This is also something that um, if you're overwhelmed by the sheer mass of our collection, you can kind of get a taste of what's there um, through these exhibits. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about where this content comes from, how we actually put this together, um, get down into the weeds a little bit. So we have what are called hubs, um, and uh, that is actually where we're drawing the content from. And let me pause here for a second and tell you a little bit about our model and, and how we work. Um, we are very lightweight. We are ingesting metadata from partners and thumbnail images where we have materials that have images into the DPLA cloud. We rely on our hubs, our partners um, that are 
donating this content, I'll talk about because they're sort of secondary partners that they are in turn aggregating. We rely on these hubs to do the hosting of the full digital version. So um, the only thing that's required to be part of DPLA is that we ingest your metadata, um, we do some enhancement that I'll talk about in just a second, um, and that we have a, um, a available to the general public, publicly viewable full version of the item. There can't be any gates to the content, there can't even be a little registration, um, none of that. It has to be a one click through from our registration, our record of that item to a full version of that item. Okay, so we rely actually on a networked model, a very web-ish kind of model. Um, if those of you who are following along in the, in the sort of two to three year planning process for the deep laid know that there very well could have been other kinds of model from the, models for the DPLA, ones where you know, we asked everyone for full copies of their items and we stored it centrally um, and, and then got rid of all the partners um, in a kind of um, mafia way. We did not <laughs> decide to go with that model, um, as exciting as that may have been. Um, we really do work, as I said at the start, um, in a collaborative model where we do rely on partners to do the hosting of the full content. Um, and we have, again, what we need to create the kind of discovery layer and research layer on top of that. Okay, so content hubs are really easy to understand. They are hubs, they are institutions that have lots and lots of material that they're giving directly to the DPLA. Right now we require these institutions to have at least a quarter million digitized items in their collection. So Smithsonian has donated hundreds of thousands, I think it's six, seven, or 800,000 items. Um, New York Public Library, again, a Hathi Trust that I mentioned, the Hathi Trust Digital Library, over a million books. Um, Art Store, um, which has artwork from over 100 museums nationwide, has donated art. Um, and one thing I should pause and say is that we are looking to ingest the, what I like to call the full range of human expression. We don't just want, sometimes people say, oh, are you guys the nonprofit Google Books? We're not, we're not that, right? We are looking for um, pulling together collections from libraries, archives, museums, and cultural heritage sites, and that includes really the full range of human expression, everything from the humanities and arts to the sciences to very <coughs> wide variety of item types that you will not see in just a book-oriented collection. So we do have lots of artwork that's available for free. Okay, so those are the big um, content hubs. We have over a dozen of them right now. Um, we're looking to partner with other big institutions um, to get that. And because these are institutions that are at scale and tend to have pretty sophisticated technical operations of their own and librarians or metadata specialists, we know that we can have a direct one-to-one -one relationship with those institutions to pull in that content. Service hubs, I think, are really interesting and really at the heart of what we're doing in DPLA. So service hubs are state or regional digital libraries that in turn aggregate from their state or region. So just to give an example, we have a service hub in Minnesota, um, Minnesota Digital Library or Minnesota Reflections, and they're pulling from well over 100 small uh, places that have digitized content across the state, including the Goodhue County Historical Society, which does have a website. Actually, they recently updated their website, and I should probably update this slide. But they have this wonderful content from the 19th century from Goodhue County. Um, and what they've done is given that material to, again, Minnesota Digital Library, which has a site called Minnesota Reflections, which has over 100,000 items from, I think, about 150 or 160 smaller locations across the state. And then we have a one-to-one -one relationship with this Minnesota Digital Library and pulling content from that. And what that allows us to do, again, in this network model, is really have a very distributed but powerful way of pulling in content from a very wide range of institutions, not just big ones like we have with our content hub, but very, very small ones like the Goodhue County Historical Society. I like to use this water metaphor. I think it's very helpful to think about the DPLA, that we have content that comes from small ponds like the Goodhue County Historical Society. It might have maybe a few hundred or a couple thousand at most um, images or documents that have been digitized or that the uh, service hub helps them to digitize. And they send it up through small stream to the lake that is our service hub and then through a river up to the ocean that is the DPLA. 
can do this in reverse. You can find uh, by searching on hot air balloon rides um, this great image from the Goodhue County Historical Society on our site. It takes you, in fact, back out. We point right back out to the full version of the openly available, publicly viewable uh, image here at Minnesota. Um, and then that takes you, again, back out to the pond and get right to the image that you want to look at. Again, our model is one where if you do a search for hot air balloon rides, you'll get that amazing 19th century image of this first hot air balloon ride uh, commingled with material not just from the small historical society in rural Minnesota, but with material from uh, the Smithsonian, from the National Archives, from institutions across the United States. We are adding these service hubs at, as quickly as we can. Um, so we recently added New York, Texas, North Carolina, uh, and Connecticut. Um, by my count, there are 50 United States. Um, so we have a little ways to go. Um, I'll talk about the stats in just a second, but it is one of our big projects in the coming years to really get um, these service hubs up and running in all the states. Um, why do these service hubs join uh, the DPLA? One of the things that we're really hearing about and why we have um, so many calls in to, for places that want to become service hubs is that it leads really to this huge surge in traffic to their content. Um, they have spent a lot of time and effort and often money to digitize this content or they have a long range project to digitize content in their state and they want this material to be used. Um, and what we're seeing is anywhere from 50% to over 100% increase in traffic once their records are added to DPLA. Because we are not only aggregating the content, we're aggregating a huge audience that's out there that's really interested in finding this material. Um, so I think our partners are really overjoyed and we hear from, again, a lot of places that want to join our network in terms of making their material more widely available. Okay, so numbers. We launched on April 18th, 2013 with about 2.4 million items. And just, just from six service hubs um, and about another six content hubs, um, in those service hubs, they were in turn aggregating from about 500 contributing institutions. So as of today, uh, I actually didn't look this morning over breakfast. I had breakfast with Lorcan, so I didn't have a chance to reload my homepage, but the uh, number tends to go up uh, every week or even sometimes every day. Um, we're at five point, almost 5.8 million items from 11 service hubs. Again, we recently added uh, almost a half dozen new service hubs from 1,200 contributing institutions. So we are growing by leaps and bounds. Um, I'd like to you know, go up, um, you know, double again in the next six months or, or 12 months would be great. Um, we've actually more than doubled. Um, so we are adding as quickly as we can, again, building out this network, building out the idea and the mission itself. This is way too small for you to probably see, but uh, <laughs> you can get a sense. Um, so this is a pie chart that Amy Rudersdorf, our assistant director of content, um, uh, uh, generated from our collection in terms of actually where uh, the content's coming from in terms of partner type. And I think what you'll see here, at least you can probably see from the many slices of pie, is that um, we are actually pretty diverse already in terms of where the content's coming from. We do have a big chunk from college and university libraries, but we also have special libraries, public libraries, 15%, 12% from museums, 11% from historical society. We have, if you add these things up, we have about 10%, actually a little bit more, 12% from state agencies, federal, local governments. Um, so we have a very diverse set of institutions and we want to continue to build that out. And we know that there are gaps out there in the kinds of institutions we're, we're reaching. But um, again, we are in the business of setting up a national collaboration. So um, we do try to think about where are we missing, what kinds of item types we're missing, what kinds of institutions are underrepresented in our collection. And we make targeted efforts to try to do some outreach to them. Obviously, to have a state hub um, in their area really helps a lot. We have a lot of collections, archives that have um, unique, um, important content that we don't have yet, but they're waiting for us. Um, and it's, it is painful sometimes to have this sort of waiting process happen, but they are waiting for us to have a service hub in their area, and so we're doing this as quickly as we can. Okay, so let me get, um, get on to the nerdy portion of the program um, and talk about the, the platform, the technical platform. Um, 
uh, what it enables, what we want to do with it, um, how it in fact might fit in with what OCLC is doing as well. So first of all, um, we do normalize the metadata and that's pretty critical and it's a kind of behind the scenes but really, really critical to what we're doing. Um, if we don't get good data and massage that data properly, I know I'm preaching to the choir here almost literally, uh, but um, you know, we have to get good data and make sure it's in good shape if we want to have those discovery interfaces work really well. Right? So we spend a lot of time thinking about how we normalize metadata, how we bring it in from, think about it, 1,200 different kinds of institutions. I mean, there are Goodhue County Historical Society, um, all the way up to Smithsonian National Archives, places that are running, you know, big iron kinds of, of infrastructure. Um, so this is really, um, I think, a, a thorny problem that we're uh, making a lot of progress on. We have ways to go on it, but um, I think normalizing that metadata and bringing it into the same format is really critical. And I think, again, here's another area where our partners are really excited about what they're doing because they get their data back, as I'll show in just a second, they get their data back in a way that conforms with a bunch of other standards, it brings it forward in time, um, and that's important. So if you go to any of our page, pages, um, and those on WebEx can, can do this live if you're on your laptop or desktop, um, look at any URL on our site and just append dot JSON, J-S-O-N, which as I'm seeing from nods in the audience, some people recognize as a very common data interchange format that's used on the web. Um, you will find that there is, in fact, this nicely uh, formatted um, JSON file. We use what a uh, standard called JSON-LD. Um, JSON part is used all across the web. If you've ever used the Twitter API, for instance, the Twitter application programming interface, the way that Twitter exchanges data. In fact, almost all of the modern ways of interfacing data now use um, JSON. And the little dash LD means that we're using an enhanced version of JSON that includes the ability to add a big payload of linked data. I want to get to that momentarily. Actually, maybe I'll get to it right now. Um, we do want to enhance the data as well. So um, when we did an import of 270,000 records from the <coughs> University of Southern California, um, they had uh, enough descriptive information and a lot of work that they had already done on their side to sort of give some descriptive information about the location of these 270,000 items. And then we ran at a very um, uh, long time on a expensive um, set of nodes in the cloud, some processing on that. It took many days to process that, to come up with the, our best guess for latitude and longitudinal coordinates for every item that we could in their collection. And that's a tremendous service that we can provide in that Here's USC's collection um, now put into Southern, they actually have materials from around uh, the region and indeed across the United States and the globe, but just focusing in on just USC's collection in the LA area, you can actually create an ad hoc map of their entire collection focused in the LA area. You can zoom in even on a block by block basis. For instance, they have um, thousands of um, incredible historical postcards. And some of those postcards have, you know, corner of Hollywood and Vine, you know, image from the 1940s, and we can actually place that on the map in that location. Again, I think a, a great service that we can provide here. Um, so enhancing the metadata, um, putting into that LD portion of the metadata the ability to find um, coordinates. Sometimes it's just an overall town and the, the dot comes out in just the center of the town. Um, but we can get as, as specific as we want. If you look at our metadata standard, there's multiple levels of geographic specificity, um, but this is a great way, I think, to enhance the data. Um, there are, in fact, are linked data methods that we would like to use um, in the future, and we're really studying this um, in depth. I would love to have more conversations today with staff here at OCLC about this, but there are, of course, um, uh, rising uh, linked data um, services and, and sort of um, standards. Um, GeoNames, for instance, if you go to geonames.org, um, you'll find that um, the Dublin High School, which is just across 270 from here, has an ID of 5152336. For some reason, this building does not have a GeoNames ID, so I think, 
This is community edited, so someone out there in the hundreds of people watching on WebEx immediately go to geonames.org and register this building or even this auditorium and give it a specific ID. So what can this do just in plain spoken way? Um, obviously, if um, we're able not only to provide a kind of basic geocoding, but in fact to give it a specific um, geonames ID, that means that we can associate any other item in the collection that has that geoname ID. Um, maybe it would be for the OCLC campus, any item that we have related to that can automatically be found through our interfaces. And so I think, again, this is a way that we can think together about how we might um, enhance collections for the future in much more powerful ways than we have right now. Um, we're obviously at the early stages of using linked data, but this is one area where uh, DPLA is going to invest a lot of time and, and thought and resources um, to doing what we do extremely well. There are other authorities and vocabularies. Um, I was excited to see OCLC come out with the Works uh, API. Um, the, at the same time, the Getty released its uh, vocabulary under an application programming interface, um, and that's a very standard vocabulary. So the Getty um, uh, released a vocabulary for art and architecture that a lot of museums use. And we'd love to get that kind of ID tag for a specific item. Um, you know, the Library of Congress obviously has uh, authority and vocabulary files for things like Plato's Allegory of the Cave. And so you can imagine if you give that ID um, 85103329 and put that ID in the JSON-LD file um, for a work of art that makes a reference to Plato's Allegory of the Cave, a book that we have from Hathi Trust that um, is about Plato's Allegory of the Cave, maybe an article that we have from a philosophy journal about Plato's Allegory of the Cave. We can find all of those in a cluster using this linked data methodology. It's really straightforward when you think about it in that way. Okay, we also are really interested in a kind of global interoperability of data. And this is something that um, uh, you know, I've been following for a long time and that I'm sure a lot of people in the room will recognize has been incredibly hard to kind of execute. Um, there's always been a lot of talk about interoperability. Interoperability like collaboration, it, it sounds great on paper, but it's really, really hard to do. Um, I mean, there's the old saw about um, standards are great because there's so many of them, um, that kind of a thing. Um, and, uh, but we are, of course, pulling um, our metadata model from Europeana. If you've looked at our metadata model, we use the Europeana data model, EDM. So we are out of the box, um, seamlessly integrated already with our friends at Europeana, which is uh, a forerunner of DPLA in Europe, already has pulled together 30 million items from across Europe. Um, what that means is that because we have reused their data model, although we've extended it with this LD portion, um, it means that uh, this year, 2014, um, Europe is celebrating, although I don't think you would call it that, celebrating it. They are remembering the 100th anniversary of the Great War, um, the First World War. And so Europeana um, has set up a website about the First World War in which the, it, they very quickly were able to integrate all of our materials about the First World War into their collection. And because Trove in Australia, Trove Australia, which is um, a similar kind of national digital library in Australia, also has an API with, again, easily integrated data. They're also pulling material from the Australian uh, corpus into what they're doing. And so if you go to their site on the First World War, you will see material, global material, about the First World War from Europeana, DPLA, and Trove all in one place because our data is interoperable and, and very easy to integrate. So that's really special, and we'd like to see, and I think a lot of um, uh, us, um, the executive directors of these national uh, digital library projects, are really in the process of talking together. In fact, I have a call on Monday um, with uh, Europeana and Trove and, and uh, the folks in New Zealand at Digital NZ and uh, perhaps others about this kind of global integration. Um, so interoperability is, is very important to us. Okay, our metadata is free. Let me, let me talk about licensing for a little bit and, and prod you all on this um, a bit. So we um, bring in the metadata and we require all the metadata to be donated under a CC0 license. That is a Creative Commons zero license, um, which is a public domain dedication. That is, these institutions are giving us the data completely freely uh, to be used in any way. Um, and uh, what that means is we have a bulk download page where you can go and get this data. Um, you can pull it from individual partners. Um, what you're pulling here is 
our enhanced version, our normalized enhanced version of their metadata. So in fact, there are partners who might want to pull back their data after the massaging has occurred. Um, and uh, it is, again, uh, maximally open in the way that you can use it. Um, so I want to talk about this that I've sort of proposed on this, because I think there's a lot of hand-wringing over how to make data available and under what kind of license. And um, I, know, I know good, smart people can disagree on this, but I, I want to make a forceful case about why we focus on CC0 rather than other kinds of licenses. Um, so the first point I would make on this is that um, uh, I think for data itself, which does, after all, want to be commingled and enhanced, and um, you know, data is used to be um, used, right? It is to be operated upon. Uh, my wife, who is a psychologist, does lots of statistical work on uh, various databases. It is meant to be munged and mixed and used in this way. And so a very permissive license allows that to happen. So there's a, a kind of practical piece of this um, that I think is, is critical to look at. Um, I think there could be a kind of ethical and indeed legal argument about the state of data and the copyrightable nature or non-copyrightable nature of data. I'm sure it's something that will come up in the discussion on Monday and Tuesday at the Copyright Office. Um, but our perspective at DPLA is that um, data like phone books um, is about descriptive information. Um, and while there is no doubt sweat of the brow that goes into it, it actually sits in a realm um, that is in fact um, should be transferable to all. Um, but then I do wonder about this question of attribution. And I think that this is where um, there's a lot of questions about, about data. Um, you know, I think that um, there are, um, our, our view is that we do want people to attribute data to the institutions that have donated it. Um, that is important to us. It's important to us in a collaborative sense, in a kind of person-to-person -person sense. Um, it's important to us as historians and librarians and archivists that uh, data maintains a certain provenance or that we know where it's come from. And so if you look at our site, we have a very strong moral entreaty, a lot of browbeating about attributing data to its original source. And in fact, our data itself includes lines about the original institution and the hub that this data has come to. So in fact, every piece of data that we ship out includes this kinds of, of attributed um, uh, information. But a lot of people ask, well, why don't we mandate legally um, an attribution piece here? And this is where I think things get very tricky. Um, there are lots of arguments about data that are about the first thing I talked about, that commingling of data and stacking of attribution is really, really difficult, that when you commingle data, it's hard to maintain that. I don't want to focus on that, although we could have a lot of discussion about that piece of it. I think the bigger issue here is actually about the clash between community norms and legalese. And here is, I think, actually a psychological perspective, and in fact, a perspective that you could look at based upon behavioral economics. Um, there's lots of work about the bad aspects of commingling moral suasion or community norms with legal entreaties. Right. So when you have something like data, where you do want attribution, and you say, we like attribution because it's the right thing to do, and you also say, um, we're mandating this under a specific license that you agree to, it mingles together two things that are very different. Um, so, um, and there's actually this kind of psychological clash on this point that I think you'll find people um, uh, chafe against. Um, there's very good work on this. If, has anyone read Dan Ariely's book, Predictably Irrational? Um, a great book on this, on this very question that when you, um, he starts with a great story about uh, moral suasion about a um, uh, after school program where the parents are, are re really browbeaten into picking up their kids on time. And um, it, it works, right? Moral suasion actually works. Um, but then they introduce this sort of legal requirement and indeed a fine for not showing up on time. And then the entire um, system goes off the rails because all of a sudden this kind of legal system has come into place um, that clashes with this notion of community norms which are powerful by themselves. So, um, so I think this is a case where if you look at the practice on our data, you'll see 
that without exception, I have not found a single exception to this, everyone who has used or reused our data and the data from our partners has in fact attributed, attributed it properly. They have attributed it properly because they feel that tremendous community norm without the legal requirement for attribution. I haven't found a single exception to this rule. So we have CC0 data, but we have this sort of grayed out plus by. Please give us attribution. It is critically important to us and our partners, and it works without exception right now. And the bad actors on the web will take your data anyway and do bad things with it. That's what bad actors do, right? Um, but without adding a kind of legal structure around our data, we've been able to get what we want, which is attribution, while also allowing for maximal openness. Okay, I'm gonna get off my high horse on this, but it is something that I wanted to at least throw out there because I think there's a lot of debate about data right now and, and data interchange. And I think CC0, at least for, again, the metadata itself, not the objects themselves, is a great way to go when paired with a kind of moral suasion. And I think it doesn't clash with certain other kinds of licensing um, that we could imagine. Okay, I'm going to stop. Okay, we have an API, Application Programming Interface. Um, what that does is it allows others to build um, on our uh, data and on our materials without running their own infrastructure. They can pull slices of our, our data out. Um, and what this means is that we have an app library of applications that people have built on top of the DPLA, which is really, really neat. Um, I encourage you to go and look at some of these. I'll highlight a few of them. We have a kind of Pinterest-style um, uh, uh, application called Culture Collage, a web app that was built by a developer in the UK. Um, uses our thumbnails to do a search on baseball. You can get all these great thumbnails. If you hover over them, you get properly attributed uh, data about what that object is. You click through, you go straight to our partners, wherever they are. Um, wonderful little application. We have mobile apps that are enabled by the DPLA API, um, like OpenPix. Um, OpenPix, which is a lot of fun, so you just uh, open the app wherever you are, it uses the GPS signal, it finds whatever we have from the DPLA, from any of our 1,200 contributing institutions, shows you the thumbnails, it's really wonderful do, for doing a little walking tour. Um, so that's available on iOS, I don't know if there's an Android version yet. Um, we have uh, library systems that are starting to integrate DPLA as a sidebar to their collections or to their discovery systems. EBSCO added to their discovery service a one-click turn on DPLA highlights where you can see that um, uh, there are materials from our very large almost six million item collection that are out there while you're searching in the general EBSCO interface. We'd love to see more of this kind of integra integration because we find that it provides additional information for free for anyone who integrates it. Um, there are wildcard things, like this project, Serendipomatic. Um, National Endowment for the Humanities funded a one-week hackathon in which a bunch of researchers, scholars, um, technologists got together and tried to do things with a variety of APIs. We're very lucky that they chose the DPLA API. And what Serendipomatic does is you can take any freeform text at all, anything that you're working on, um, a, paragraph from a web article that you're reading or a paper that you're writing if you're a student. Just take your whole text, cut and paste it into that box that's sort of cut off at the bottom there, and it will extract meaningful terms, signif statistically significant terms from your text, pass that to our API, and have our API return objects of interest to you. Really, really neat way to find, in a serendipitous way, um, what we might have at the DPLA without being able to maybe fully articulate the kinds of search terms that you might be interested in on our site proper. Really neat kind of idea. Um, we have had others because we are fully open access and all of our code is up on GitHub um, for free, open source. Um, Serbia now uses the DPLA code for their digital library, the Cultural Center of Novi Sad contacted me and said, oh, hey, we've got a site up. Um, you probably can't read it because it's in Cyrillic um, and Serbian, uh, which I do not speak. Um, but uh, so Novi Sad took our code base right off of GitHub. They are digitizing content um, around Serbia and they completely reused our platform. You can see there's map, timeline, um, and uh, image search. Um, so, um, 
uh, that's great. I think this is a really wonderful outcome of making all of our stuff very freely available. And again, they do this all with attribution. I link back. I got a really super nice um, email. There's a great YouTube video of the cultural emissary announcing this site. So um, another great outcome. OK, I'm not going to toot our horn too much. We were on the Time, Time Magazine top, top 50 interesting, life-changing, informing, entertaining websites of 2013. Um, we've gotten awards from various library organizations, American Association of School Librarians. We were on the Nominate Trust um, 100 uh, Most Inspiring Social Innovations last year. Um, I'm happy with our progress. We've got a long way to go, um, but we're, we're already receiving some recognition, which is wonderful because um, I think the community, and I don't mean that just in terms of the staff, the DPLA community, all of these thousands of people who have participated in the DPLA have worked really hard to get where we are. And that is indeed where I, I want to sort of end before we get to the question and answer point is about the community. Um, you know, we are a small central organization. Right now there are just eight of us actually in the central office. We started off with three. Um, we are up to eight. Um, hope to grow maybe to 11 or 12 um, in the next um, you know, few months. Uh, but you know, we are a very lightweight organization. And so we do really rely on the community to help us out. Um, and and we, want that, we want them to help us not in a Tom Sawyer-ish paint, paint the fence way. We actually want them to be part of what we're doing to be a really important part of what we're doing because we just can't do what we're doing without them. So we have a number of community um, uh, initiatives. Obviously, we have our hubs network, which is really at the center, especially our service hubs. But we do have something that I'll point out, um, that, and maybe there's someone in the room or on WebEx who'd like to be a part of this. We have a community reps program where we have people across the country, and indeed in two countries outside the United States, <laughs> who are uh, reps for us. Um, it's a unpaid function. Um, you do get lots of swag. Um, everything that we have from uh, mugs and tote bags to t-shirts and a variety of other things. Um, lots of laptop stickers and other, other things like that. Um, uh, and, and lots of high fives from me. Um, but um, these are people who really are, are into what we're doing, um, are really do want to help us out. Um, and uh, we have a nice sheet of all their names and, and their interests uh, up on our website. You can actually browse them like our collection by map. Uh, we have a map-based ba interface for our reps. Um, and um, this is a case where um, you know, I can only travel so much. <laughs> and and uh, we do need people out there across the country evangelizing for us, helping to get others interested, going to schools, going to libraries, talking about what's involved. Um, with the DPLA. Um, so it's really important to us. In fact, our reps have been so energetic already. They have created videos of introductions that are you know, as good or better than what we've been able to do on our site that give an overview into what's going on in DPLA. They've gone out and given talks. Um, they've you know, talked about ways that they can um, involve the, their communities in what we're doing. Um, we have had hackathons where um, more technically oriented reps have gone out with other uh, and gathered a bunch of folks together and, and created um, new applications based on our interface. We recently had a hackathon in Philly at ALA Midwinter or Associated sort of right before ALA Midwinter um, in which um, they created just in one day, they created an application to integrate DPLA with Wikipedia so that Wikipedia editors can discover materials from the DPLA that relate to the article they are trying to edit on Wikipedia, and so they can link to the original primary sources, which is great. Um, as a historian, I'm really interested in this because Wikipedia often links to sort of sketchy materials, so it's great to actually have them link to vetted materials from the actual collections. Um, on a more um, uh, lighter <laughs> note, <laughs> There's actually several Twitter accounts that use the DPLA API. I'm totally fine with that. I'm very down with that. Um, historical Cats pulls, we actually have quite a few Historical Cats in our collection. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, know, you think that this is just a modern obsession online with <laughs> pictures of cute cats. But actually, when you look through 5.7 million items, you find that a lot of them are of cats in funny situations. Um, 
And so it is really great to have this new account. I think it's got over 100 followers now at Historical Cats. On Twitter, it does a search through our API of cats um, and images of cats. It pulls one each day and it posts it to Twitter. Um, and so I encourage you, if you are on Twitter, to follow at Historical Cats. Um, there's also a, um, uh, an account, uh, I'm going to forget the name right now, um, that takes um, a random, actually it's a really serendipitous kind of account, and I'm sorry I'm, I'm missing the name right now, but uh, that pulls from DPLA um, a kind of more random image on a specific chosen item each day um, and tweets about that as well, and it's kind of a neat way to kind of encounter things you might not imagine. Okay, I mentioned we're a lightweight organization. I just want to end with the staff who really is responsible. Um, I go around on my high, high horse, as you, you've seen, and give talks like this, but uh, you know, these are the people who are really doing the work other than me, Amy Rudersdorf, who I mentioned. I'm, I'm, I'm also naming them because I think, again, this is a crowd that very well may have commerce with these folks in the future, and so it's great to get to know them already. Amy Rudersdorf there in the upper left, who's our assistant director for content. Emily Gore, who are, is our director for content. Um, she's the person that new hubs go to contact to get involved at that level. Frankie Abbott is a project manager who's working with us on a variety of projects, including a project that was funded by the Gates Foundation to do outreach specifically to public librarians at small uh, public libraries and to train them in digital methods. Kenny Whitebloom, who was part of the initial planning phase at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society, has joined us as project coordinator. We have an intern, Hillary Brady from uh, Brown University, who does some of our um, public relations, um, tweet of the day, things like that, um, some blog posts. And we have what I like to call probably badly the two marks. We have two marks who are our technical staff. Um, that's right, we do this with two marks, our entire technical staff. Um, we're, we are actually looking to hire a non-MARC uh, <laughs> software developer. Um, if your name is not Mark, I'm happy to talk to you today um, and, and poach you from OCLC. Um, uh, it's, I'm happy to take a third Mark, but it's complicated. Um, <laughs> Mark Matienzo, our director of technology on the left, and Mark Breedlove, um, who is our technical specialist and does a lot of the ingest now, um, crosswalk of the metadata. Both very, very talented people. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm really amazed with what these folks have been able to do. I mean, we are running a very sophisticated technical operation. I like to believe we're doing a lot with very little. Um, I think from a sustainability standpoint, this is one of the remarkable things that can be done in 2014 with the state of the web and the ability to use cloud services and these sorts of things is we can run a pretty lightweight organization that actually fights, I think, well above its weight. We can scale up quite a ways from this or maybe with a few more staffers to what we want to do. I think it's also part of our model as well. So again, I think part of our sustainability is that we're, we're a smaller organization and we can, we're trying to be a good partner with others to think about where we can add value to the kind of digital and knowledge ecosystem. Um, and uh, again, we look forward to additional partnerships and to working with others across the country um, to build uh, this great project um, that I am very enthusiastic about. I will leave you with this amazing map of Ohio um, from long ago, um, in fact, before formation. And um, this is one of the maps that was donated uh, as part of the, um, uh, actually, uh, Texas joining us. This map is from um, the Texas um, uh, hub that we just added. For some reason, it has a lot of materials from Ohio. But it just goes to show you, I think, part of what's going on here is that when you break out of these sort of siloed collections, you find that actually they already are talking to each other. Libraries are, in fact, already by their nature intermingled, very social. They're connected by data. They're collected by information. And most of all, I think they're collect connected by people. And so that is the thought I will leave you with today. And I'm very happy to take questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, Dan. Um, the picture of cats reminds me of a presentation I saw recently where somebody said there is an uh, alternate universe where cats look at pictures of humans. <laughs> uh, uh, with that, we will uh, take questions for Dan. And just maybe as a, as a 
courtesy to Dan and to uh, others in the room and on WebEx maybe if you could say uh, who you are as you ask the question and uh, we will also take questions from uh, WebEx. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, I'm George Needham. I'm uh, Vice President here for Global and Regional Council. So I have a question about the uh, libraries that are upstream in the, in the data provision. For example, that Goodhue uh, Historical Society, are they aware or are they contact or they give their okay to have that information uploaded to yes. you? Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so everybody's aware. There's nothing secret going on here. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, that is really critical to us that uh, upstream, downstream, however you want to use the metaphor, um, that people are, are aware of what they're doing. Um, you know, I, I will say that, um, uh, you know, to provide a, a semi-criticism of my being on my high horse about CC0, I think, you know, that is one point that we do need to do some discussions with some partners about, um, you know, we talk about why it's important to us, but again, it's something that we have been able to get folks to sign off on once they understand what's happening. And um, they also understand that um, it, you know, it doesn't detract, as you saw from the web stats, you know, we're still passing, often without even touching our website, because more people are actually u coming to those sites via our API than coming to our website first and hopping over. They understand that contributing this data means that they are bringing this tremendous traffic back to them. In, in some sense, they're very aware also that um, the free flow of data actually enhances what they has, it, have. It allows them to tell their stakeholders that their stuff is being more widely used. And uh, I think it detracts absolutely nothing for them from them because they actually have the stuff themselves. So I think that, that is really critical to point out that, that, again, we're not asking for like freebies or anything. We're trying to talk about a way and setting up a network and setting it up the structures correctly so that everybody sort of get some benefit from that. And I think that's always critical in collaboration to not have one partner feel like they're being, you know, dragged in kicking and screaming. Hi, Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Mixter and I work in the Office of Research. And uh, I, I saw that you'd mentioned that uh, you can deliver uh, data as JSON-LD. Uh, and I was just curious about what, what data format do you use internally um, to, to manage yeah. Uh, and, and massage it, and also how do you, uh, when you deliver that data back to uh, uh, customers uh, or, or uh, contributors, how do you ensure that you deliver it back in a format that, that they use internally? Right, okay, so everything is in JSON-LD. I should be clear about that. Our technical infrastructure actually is a whole bunch of sharded servers with a whole bunch of JSON-LD on it and <laughs> Elasticsearch on top of it. It's a very modern infrastructure. It's a similar kind of infrastructure that's used by other web services. Um, so if you look at our technical infrastructure, that's how we're storing this data is in a kind of document-based, text-based way in JSON-LD. So there's nothing going on behind the scenes where we're in some you know, SQL kind of environment. Um, that's how we live. It's, it's all in that way. Um, there are lots of tools out there for transforming JSON-LD or JSON, right, into objects that can be reused. I think a lot of the work that happens is in the crosswalk from the original source into our metadata application profile. And so I think if you're really interested in this, I encourage you to look at our metadata application profile. It's on our site in the developers section. And you'll get a sense of, of what we're up against in terms of, again, doing those kinds of transformations. Maybe I could ask where um, you're based in Boston Public right. Library uh, uh, physically, staff-wise. Um, uh, w what sort of uh, mechanisms do you use to serve up your data? Do you do you source a data center with somebody? Yeah. Or? Okay. Uh, right now we're on Rackspace. Um, we may move to Amazon Web Services or others, but uh, we just you know spin up nodes in Rackspace's cloud right now. Um, and you know I think anyone who's been you know doing development now. Um, I know certainly for Zotero, I mean, Zotero literally started on a rack that was at George Mason, and then it became very clear later on that we couldn't scale with it. It was much more expensive, and there were all kinds of maintenance issues. So I think, um, again, we use a kind of modern way of approaching it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Tip House in the Innovation Lab. Um, given the, the one-click access requirement to, yeah. to the content, uh, do you foresee or have you had any problems with the links going bad and do you have a mechanism in place to uh, address that? Great, yeah, great question. Um, so uh, we, we haven't had a lot of links go bad, but I think as anyone who studied link rot will know that it's really not in the months 
time span. It's well, sometimes it's in the month time span, but it's certainly in the year time span. One of the things that we're doing is a constant re-ingest, very regular re-ingest from partners. And particularly, I think here is where from the service hubs, that's really critical, where we have a model where we're going out, fetching the data again, doing the re-ingest, bless you, and, um, and, and getting corrections in that way, as well as new items that have come in since the last pass. So it is something that we're aware of. I think if we did this project as something where it was static and we did a one-time ingest, we'd be in big trouble over the long run. Yes. Right. Um, Kathy DeRosa, um, Vice President of the Americas, and Dan, thank you very much for, for being here today. Um, I'm going to leave the technical side for a minute, so um, uh, roll the clock forward for us and sure. help us uh, in, from your vision. Yeah. Um, you get to success, what does that look like? Right. And a lot of the discussion I know in the space is how is this going to interface effectively with physical libraries yeah. and there's been a lot of really great dialogue. Um, your thoughts on that? Uh, great, a great set of questions. So, you know, I think we still have a lot of work as, as I was explaining earlier in terms of just our core mission. We have many more hubs to bring online, not just the service hubs by the way, but we also feel like there are some um, target rich environments in the content hub area that we'd like to bring on board um, that have a lot of a lot of content or that plan to digitize content in the coming year so just in our just straight up core mission you know we have millions probably tens of millions of items to go and indeed if you know I, I don't know what the universe would be but it's probably in the billions of items held in these kinds of institutions so we'll be continuing to build up that area I think Beyond that, when I, when I think out, I go back to the phrase I used early on about the full range of human expression. And I think those who have uh, participated in the planning stage and then also into all of our open calls, and by the way, if people are interested in the DPLA, we have open board calls, committee calls, we have committees on technical things, legal things, content, outreach, all those things are all open. You'll, you'll hear there's a lot of chatter right now about ways that we can, in fact, fulfill that vision of the full range of human expression. So there are certain kinds of item types that we're really weak on right now. One that we're really focusing on um, in our committee calls right now is audiovisual material, um, which we don't have as much as we would like to have. And so we are trying to think about how we might onboard more of that material, which is just not naturally coming in through our network. So we may spin up what we're sort of colloquially calling um, a meta hub or a hub that sort of operates across the United States that focus on, on, focuses on a specific item type, let's say audio or video. Um, so I think that will happen again to fill in some of these gaps. Um, there are other uh, subject areas where, um, for instance, medicine we're weak on right now, so we're working, I think, to pull in some more materials there. Um, I think we're really interested in what's going on in, um, at, a, at a federal level with the open access mandate. Um, and uh, we would love to be part of the aggregation of scholarly and research content from America's um, universities and, and colleges and other research institutes that receive federal funding. So that's something we're looking at very deeply and that again by itself is a tremendous, you know, tens of millions of items kind of a fish. Um, uh, and so I think there are, again, areas that we can expand into. Um, one more that I'll mention, I think, is that we are interested in, in looking at e-books um, and, and more recent e-books. And something I've been thinking a lot about and gets back to that third P in our, um, in our, our little um, opening slide there about the public option. Um, I, I think that, again, we have a very mess messy situation with recent e-books right now in terms of licensing, in terms of DRM, and, and these sorts of things. Um, at the same time, I, I think that um, I've seen more and more um, presses, obviously not the big five, but um, university presses, genre fiction presses, um, indies, other places are now trying out different models, including ones where some books are open access. And if there's any way that DPLA in its spirit can facilitate that and also bring readers to that kind of open content, I think that's very intriguing to us as well. So I think there are big other areas, again, that go along with, that mesh well with our core mission um, in um, this broad sort of cultural heritage area that we've staked out as a kind of first area. And I think you'll see 
more things done in those other areas as we as we get going. Um, there's also, you know, we've I've talked about this this talk being about inside the DPLA and getting into data and things like that, but I'm really interested in actual use <laughs> as well of the content itself and not just the data. And so um, I'm very very interested um, as uh, and as a teacher, I'm very interested in this as making sure this gets in the classrooms, you know, K through 20 um, classrooms. I think it can be used very well in all those environments. I think you'll see some initiatives on the education front and on the public programs front, front as well, in ways that we can involve the general public. So I think those are all a little bit more distant as we work through this core, um, core infrastructure, core network kind of building, but um, you'll definitely see those things in the coming years. Uh, Melissa, while we're uh, moving the microphone here, do you want to ask a couple of questions from WebEx? Sure. Um, the first question is, if individual libraries join, do they need to work with a hub? Okay. So um, if you do not have a quarter million items, um, a number that may <laughs> go down in the future as we staff up and are able to handle um, uh, smaller collections, um, then yes, we, we do require that you work with uh, a service hub. So if you're a small let's say public library, um, we are doing our best to, again, build the network out so that you can work directly with um, an institution uh, nearby. Um, and uh, um, again, I think that's just uh, part of the model and the way we work, and uh, it's a sort of pragmatic consideration more than anything else. Steven Chindetti here, uh, technical product manager, uh, responsible for uh, managing OCLC's uh, linked data implementation. I was wondering if there's been any discussion between OCLC and DPLA to uh, have OCLC be a service hub, and if that discussion has happened, what's the state of it? If not, would you be interested? Um, sure. So um, I believe I have more meetings today after this, so um, <laughs> maybe, maybe this will come up. I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer this, but uh, no, we, we, we don't, but um, again, uh, we are, we're very happy to talk about potential ways that we can collaborate. I mean, obviously, you all ho hold several orders of magnitude more data than we do, um, and you have sophisticated technical operations in place. And so, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm here to listen as much as to talk, and I'm very happy to think about ways that, that uh, we could do data interchange and data enhancement and those sorts of things. Um, again, I, I, my ultimate concern really is for what I just said on the last question in terms of the end user and their experience, and I, I think, Making sure that that data and what you can do with linked data um, really gets out there, you know, not just to the technical community and the library community, but actually out to real people and has an impact on the way that they do research, I think to me um, is, is the most important thing. And I think thinking through ways that we can do that together would be great. Here in the front. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, hi, my name is uh, Peter Murray. I'm a guest here, uh, uh, but employed by Lyricist. Right. Uh, my question is, uh, the DPLA right now points to end objects, be they a, a photograph or audiovisual material. Um, has there been thought given to cases where there isn't an end digital object? And I'm thinking of EAD finding aids, museum catalogs, uh, those kinds of things. Right. Uh, great question. Um, so, uh, no. I think I think for now those are sort of off the table. Um, I, our feeling was really that we wanted to have a direct link to a publicly viewable object and not have another stop off in a finding aid. Um, so at this point, we I wouldn't say we've like ruled it out, but it it just it just simply doesn't fit into our model in that way. Um, it is tricky in that there are places, I think Trove, for instance, in Australia, actually links to finding aids. And they have a much larger collection because of that, um, because they're ingesting just straight up records rather than records that point to a publicly viewable object. And so in some sense, we've circumscribed um, what, what we're doing. But I, I think right now it's a, it's a wise choice in that, um, I think, again, from a user experience standpoint, um, rather than a back-end standpoint, it, it, it leads to better outcomes in terms of what people are actually looking for. And because the, the universe of finding aids is so much larger than the universe of scanned items, you'd have, uh, I think, frankly, a search problem where you'd have um, a list that would include a lot of finding aids and not a lot of um, you know, fun, get-to-the-item kinds of experience. 
Hi, I'm Greg Zick, Vice President of Engineering. And um, I wanted to know what your view is or your direction related to institutional repositories yeah. versus cultural heritage hubs. Uh, I'm very interested in institutional repositories. I think the whole organization is in interested in this. Um, I think it goes uh, hand in hand with what's going on with the open access mandate as well. I think there's a lot of hidden content, frankly, in IRs that we could um, bring to light, right? I mean, that we could bring to an environment. So this is something that we are looking at very, very carefully and how we can pull, um, you know, records and, and pointers out of DSpace installations, for instance, and, and what we might be able to do with that. So I think this is something you'll see us working on sooner rather than later. Melissa, maybe we'll take a couple more questions from WebEx. Sure. Um, there's a question from Scott Brower, archivist at La Crosse Public Library in Wisconsin. His question is, has there already been contact made with potential service hubs in all states? For example, what will be Wisconsin's service, hu service hub? Yeah. In your analogy, I'm a pond. What will be my lake? <laughs> wow, that's a, a beautiful, beautiful lyric. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's an Elton John song. Um, <laughs> So I, I am probably going to talk out of turn here, and I, I hope I, I, I am not wrong, but I believe that there has been some talk with um, folks in Wisconsin. Actually, Amy Rudersdorf lives in Wisconsin. Um, so we have a somewhat distributed staff, and I'm almost positive that we've had at least some initial contact, and I just can't remember precisely where that might be. Um, I should say we have right now, um, you know, we have a kind of working spreadsheet that we're trying to make our way through as quickly as we can of people who have contacted us. And I believe right now, from, uh, from what I've heard, we have about 40 institutions or state networks that are interested in becoming either content or service hubs. So, I mean, we have, uh, you know, people in the pipeline, institutions in the pipeline um, in most parts of the country, I think over half of the states already that are kind of, you know, in early stages where we have to kind of go through it. And, and it's, an, it's a somewhat involved process in that, um, you know, we obviously need to have legal agreements in place, but more than that, we need to have workflow in place and thinking about division of labor. A lot of what we do is sort of just thinking through a good workflow with those kinds of institutions. And there have been very different kinds of hubs. There are hubs that, that are a little bit more monolithic that might be one particular institution that services that state. Um, we have others that act as almost mini, like microcosms of DPLA in their state. If you look at, for instance, New York, uh, the Empire State Digital Network, um, that is actually a coalition of, I think, around nine institutions, all of whom have you know, really talked very deeply and I think had a very healthy conversation about how they could divide up the labor. They chose an institution, Metro, which is the Metro Area Council of Libraries to act as a kind of just leadership uh, node within that network of, of nine institutions. There are institutions that are very complementary in that Empire State Network. Um, for instance, MoMA is part of it, and obviously they're part of the museum world, and they know how to do outreach and work with museums, but there are also upstate library networks that are part of it that work straight with libraries. So for New York, which is obviously a, a very big state, um, there's, there's all kinds of things that would have to go on within the state first. So, so, um, so I guess I'm asking for patience here a little bit in that there are different models. We sort of have to pursue them um, in, in a measured pace so that we can bring them on well. Um, and, uh, you know, again, we're just doing this as quickly as we can. But I, I think Wisconsin is, in fact, um, in the pipeline. Thanks. We've got a couple more um, online if we can take those. Uh, next is from Bruce Washburn. He's at OCLC Research in our San Mateo office. And his question is, are you considering accepting user, con excuse me, user contributed content in DPLA, tags, comments, corrections, related links, et cetera? OK, great, great question. Uh, so we are not currently accepting um, user created content. So um, we're, we're not just a um, you know, place that anyone can upload their content in, into. As much as we are interested in, in personal content as well. And in fact, in Europeana, um, they did for this World War I um, 100th anniversary, they did across actually Europe um, some events to scan in material, personal material from family <coughs> archives and things like that. And that is, 
Um, definitely not uninteresting to me, and I think in the long run, you know, I would love to see, again, in the bit longer run. We, we don't have the capacity right now to just sort of take all kinds of things. And also, um, uh, you know, we are, I think, known as a brand as being a place for vetted content that comes from trusted institutions. And so I think we have the problem that a lot of other institutions have of, you know, what happens when you kind of commingle that material with just, you know, uploaded material that hasn't really been vetted or, or looked over metadata-wise or content-wise. Okay, having said that, again, in, in the longer run, um, you know, and, and this came out in the planning phase as well, it'd be neat to have local scanning events. Um, Emily Gore had this great idea of a Scanabago. Um, that would be a, a Winnebago with scanning, you know, uh, flatbed scanners in the back, and um, Emily and I would drive around the country with trucker hats and, and playing country music, and, and uh, it'd be great, and I would love to do that, but, but we're really at this kind of early stage. So that's what I would say on, on user-generated content, per se, is that I think it's more of like a three to five year out sort of thing when we get to it, and we would really need to think about how, what the processes would be around that. Okay, having said that, um, we are interested in, in public participation. We actually, um, a lot of people don't know this, but we do have a, a way to report errors in terms of metadata. Um, there's a way to actually log it that goes straight into our, um, our, um, our, our ticket, ticketing system for our tech team to take a look at. Um, so um, obviously we also have an email address that people can write into. We have had the public find egregious errors in our data just as everyone has some bad data here and there um, and we really en encourage that. Um, in terms of the, and I think this is what the, the uh, uh, questioner is sort of asking on, in terms of the maybe weakification of our pages, um, you know, I think um, it's, a, it's an intriguing idea. I think again because we have a small staff size and it's hard to know about how we have kind of um, uh, community moderation and those sorts of things involved. Um, I'm not sure right now what um, just a, a free-for-all in terms of adding links and, and things like that would help out on. But, um, but you know, all these things are, are interesting. I think it's the kind of thing that um, we're both very idealistic, I think, as you've seen from my talk in terms of our mission, but we're also very pragmatic in the way that we want to get there. And I, I think keeping that mix of idealism, yes, we, we do in the long run would love to get those shoe boxes from grandma's attic, that's awesome. And as a historian, I would love that stuff, but I'm also pragmatic in that uh, we don't have the capacity right now to kind of handle those sorts of things or to handle um, user uh, modifications right now of our data. Um, so um, we're intrigued by it. We're intrigued by, we had some people use our API for metadata games, which the general public can use to add descriptive metadata and other metadata to our items and crowdsourced uh, descriptive information, I am very intrigued by. I've actually written articles on this. And so I'm intrigued by that. Again, idealistic, but as executive director, I'm also pragmatic that right now it's something that we sort of have to look at carefully, listen to how it might work, think about the integration considerations, and then do it at the right time when we can yeah. do it correctly. I, I believe that somebody did um, point out a mistake in WorldCat recently. Um, <laughs> uh, and what happened to them? The first one. Um, well, they were cheered and it was corrected. <laughs> um, Melissa, we'll, we'll go with a couple more WebEx questions and then we'll come back to the room. Okay, great. Thank you. The, the next question is, um, let's see here, it, from Haiyan Kwan. And the question is, how do you keep the links in the contributed metadata current? Right, so um, again, we do these um, regular uh, re-ingests from all of our partners, um, and uh, that um, does keep everything fresh. So there, there are often, in fact, corrections on metadata at the local level that we then want to get back upstream into the DPLA. But again, if items move, those sorts of things, that's all corrected as part of the re-ingest process. Um, and it's also how we get new content in from all of our partners. So we do have a, a constant refreshing of the data that goes on, um, and uh, I think that will be critical. You know, again, it depends on the pace and the size of the institution and those sorts of things on how regularly we uh, we do those updates. Thank you. The next question is from, excuse me, from Stephen Hearn, and his question is: Has there been interest in DPLA from the genealogical community? Are there apps to serve that interest? Ah. That is great. So I actually was just, uh, let's see, on Friday I did a podcast with a big um, 
uh, genealogy um, magazine, uh, family magazine. Um, and uh, there's a tremendous interest out there um, among genealogists and, and family historians of um, what's in DPLA. It's one of the, the best things that we can do, again, is to surface a lot of this content. Um, and in fact, things like our map interface allow uh, genealogists and others to actually zoom back into their family's hometown and see what we've got right there. So this is, I think, a great service that we can provide. We, we do, in fact, have um, materials, again, full range of human expression. We have death records in our collection, tens of thousands of them. Um, we have uh, hundreds of family Bibles that have been digitized and have um, front matter that um, if you've done any historical study of family Bibles, you know that you can pull a lot of genealogical data off of the front and back matter in, in family Bibles. Um, so we have lots of those from our partners. Um, you know, there's a very, a very wide variety of materials that I think um, uh, are applicable. We have in our book collection, actually, um, books on family uh, and genealogical uh, interests. So um, I think that's something that will only grow over time, especially as we get service hubs in particular states of, of the genealogists um, and where they're interested. Um, but we know there's already tremendous use uh, in that front. Um, and I uh, had a great podcast uh, last week on that um, where lo lots of good questions on that front. So yes, um, absolutely. Okay, so let's, let's take um, one question in the room and finish with a uh, WebEx question. So Peggy. Hi, I'm Peggy Gallagher from Market Analysis here at OCLC. I have a non-technical question as well. Sure. Um, can you talk just a little bit about the funding, the, the funding, the fu sure. your funding model? Sure. Um, so we are uh, currently funded by a range of public and private foundations um, and personal donors. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, these include, uh, I mentioned the Gates Foundation, um, Sloan Foundation really was a sort of foundational, um, so to speak, uh, <laughs> uh, foundational uh, uh, supporter of the DPLA, both in the planning phase and, um, and then giving us over a million dollars to get up and running as an independent 501c3 nonprofit. Um, so Sloan has been super critical. Um, we had an anonymous donor who really appreciated our idealism and our mission to democratize access to this tremendous record who gave close to a half a million dollars last summer. Um, uh, truly anonymous, I, I, I mean that. Um, I have no idea who it is. Um, and, um, uh, and then we've had support from the Knight Foundation in Knight communities. Um, folks may know that um, uh, the Knight Foundation often supports um, local history and cultural heritage in um, cities and states where the night newspapers were. Um, so they've supported some of our um, network building of service hubs in their areas. Um, been extremely generous um, uh, with uh, funds and also just uh, advice and support in what we're doing. Um, we've had federal funders like the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the National Endowment for Humanities, um, I'm, I'm probably forgetting a few off the top of my head, but you know, I, I would say we've had a range and, and you know, there are more irons in the fire for this kind of, of um, key support um, to get us up and running. Um, we're, still, we're still so young, I, you know, I get asked a lot of questions and I'm sure I'll get more of them um, as the day goes on about sustainability and those sorts of things. And as executive director, it's obviously, it's foremost on my mind. I think we're incredibly lucky to have these, you know, very blue chip supporters at this point. But um, I think it's incumbent upon me to diversify our funding and to think about different ways that we can move forward in the long run because this is a, a marathon uh, kind of project where we're, we're not here just for a year or two. Um, it's not just a, a one-off grant funded project. And so we'll be thinking in the coming years about uh, how to um, acquire different kinds of, of support uh, and revenue. I think there'll always be some interest, and I, I'm very, very grateful to our funders, um, you know, who, who really do appreciate the mission and want to support this kind of open access. And so um, I'm hopeful that there'll, there'll always be that kind of support, um, but I think we can c cultivate other forms of, of support as well and, and other forms of revenue as we um, grow. Okay, Melissa, we'll take the final question. Thank you. This question is from Claire Coco from OCLC. The Mountain West Digital Library shared that as a service content hub, the DPLA is funding all of its staff except the executive director through grants. What is the time duration of those funds and what is the long-term sustainability plan for supporting service hubs?
Right. Okay. So um, service hubs, uh, in, I, I, in what I just mentioned, so for instance, the Knight Foundation grant, um, we split with service hubs to help support their staff. Um, so each of those service hubs, Mountain West Digital Library, gets a subgrant um, from us to help support their operations for a, a limited term. Um, and it is a limited term. We do need to figure out a way to um, support those operations. It, it is true that um, if you look at the um, funding on things like service hubs, there's a big hump to be gotten over at the start. And funds do help in that initial stage, although there are other hubs that are doing self-funding, like our New York hub is self-funded out of in-kind labor among the network. That's wonderful. There are other places where an application of some money can really help to kind of support some initial things. But we are going to have to rely on some in-kind labor in the long run. And what we found, I think, already is that there is a big hump to get over in terms of getting the workflows in place, doing some of the initial outreach to institutions that want to donate content. Those sorts of things in the first year or two, um, I, I think, are going to be a little bit more expansive than in the later years. And so I think there will hopefully be a little bit of reduction of the amount of labor it takes, the number of FTEs and so forth in the long run. But I do think it's a great question that, that Claire has about this, um, about what the long range funding will be like. Um, I think there will absolutely have to be some donation of labor throughout the entire system, some in-kind labor that will have to happen um, if you want to be a, a service hub because um, uh, you know I, I'm not sure that we can support um, this kind of, um, you know, uh, level of um, uh, granting, you know, for in perpetuity. So I think thinking about those kinds of questions is, is important as well. Um, so, um, so I think, you know, in general, um, these are important questions about sustainability. It's something that not only am I wrestling with, our board is wrestling with, I think our entire community is wrestling with, um, but I think the most important thing to get out is that um, there is tremendous community interest in supporting this project. Um, again, I think we've, we've been very lucky to have supporters and funders um, agree with that overall mission. And uh, we're working this out as we go along. Good. OK, as, as Dan mentioned, he's going to be here for a while uh, today. We'll have a variety of discussions. We look forward to learning more about DPLA. Hopefully, uh, Dan will learn a little bit more uh, about OCLC. We serve. Uh, very overlapping uh, constituencies. We'd like to find ways of uh, improving uh, that relationship, so we look forward to that. And uh, maybe we could thank uh, Dan again for a uh, very interesting. <laughs>